What is a string container? It is nothing but a piece of code that can create objects, assign values to the instance variables of that object and customize that object. Assigning values to the instance variables is nothing but dependency injection. Hello everyone. My name is Rangar Reddy. In this course, we will learn about the different ways that are available to create objects using Spring Framework. I won't be covering dependency injection in this course. I believe that learning about bean creation and bean injection separately will make it easy for us to understand the concepts clearly. Now let us get into the course. Hello everyone. This is the application I will be using in this course and all of my future courses. It is a simple web application that takes user input, stores them in a database and display the result in the output page. The reason why I have kept it simple is that I want you to focus on the concepts of whatever you are learning rather than focusing on what the application is doing. Now let me switch over to STS. Before that, let me show you the database. This is the table that is user underscore TBL. Currently there are no records in the table. Now let me build the application. Start the server and launch the application. Now let me enter the name, age, sex and hit submit. Well, a record got created and the result is displayed here in the output page. Thank you for watching. Hello everyone. In this chapter, let us look into the project structure and the control flow. There are five packages, controller, service, DAO, domain and finally one for utility classes. Then we have our JSPs, input JSP and output JSP, a web.xml to configure the server container, an application context.xml to configure the spring container and then the static resources. Now let us see what happens when the user hits the URL. This is related to spring MVC and I won't be covering spring MVC in this course. Right now all you need to know is that when user hits the URL, request will be forwarded to this method and the page will be return and that's how you get this page displayed. Next, when the user enters the name, age, sex and hit submit, request will be forwarded to this method. Here in this method, we extract the values from the request object and use them to create the user object. We then pass on the user object to the service layer that is to this method and then to the DAO layer that is to this method where it gets persisted to the database. This is plain old JDBC. Next, we call another method in the service layer which in turn calls a method in the DAO layer. Here we retrieve the list of users from the user table, store the result in a list and finally return the list. Now we add the list of users to the model object and return the page. And that's how we get this page. Hope you understood the flow. Thank you for watching. Hello everyone. Initially, we will use an XML file to configure the Spring Container and then we will use a Java class to configure the Spring Container. Let us begin with the initial setup. There are two things to be configured in the web.xml context class and context config location. That is implementation of Spring Container that we want to use and location and name of the file that configures the Spring Container. Default container implementation used is XML web application context. Default location of the configuration file is web -inf and default name should be of the format servlet name hyphen servlet.xml. So in our case, it should be dispatcher servlet hyphen servlet.xml because dispatcher servlet is the name we have given to the servlet. We can configure the defaults if we want. As far as the container implementation is concerned, we will stick with the default implementation that is XML web application context. As far as the configuration file is concerned, let us name it as application context.xml. If we have decided to use the default container implementation, then we don't have to specify it here. So in the end, this is how it will look like. Next, create the configuration file for the Spring container. That is create application context.xml file and place it under the hyphen inf folder. Now let us include the necessary tags to configure the Spring container. Step one, include the encoding declaration. Step two, include the beans tag. Step three, Declare a prefix that is XSI for the core namespace used in XSD. Step 4. Declare the namespace and the schema location for using the bean tag. You don't have to memorize this. You can just cut copy paste from an existing document. And before registering our application beans, let us register a couple of Spring MVC components. First, let us configure an implementation of HTTP request handler to serve static resources. Next, let us configure a view resolver. These two beans will be common in all of the upcoming chapters where we use XML file to configure the Spring Container. Real meat is the one that we declare for our application objects, which we will be seeing from the next chapter. Thank you for watching. Hello everyone. 
Before proceeding further, I want to clarify a few things. Of the many operations performed by a spring container, we will be looking only at instantiation in this course. Currently, these are the classes in our application. In order for our application to work, we need to create instances of these classes, inject the classes with the appropriate dependencies. And in this course, we will be looking only at bean creation. That is, we won't be injecting dependencies using Spring Framework. And to keep things simple, I will be using Spring Framework to create instances of only the controller classes. That is, instances of input controller and output controller. So, in the end, it will be like this. To create the instances of service and DAO classes, I will be using the regular new operator. And as far as the domain classes are concerned, we normally won't use Spring Framework to create objects. In fact, we are not supposed to manage domain objects using Spring Framework. It is something that should be dealt by the business logic. So, I'll be using new operator for domain objects as well. By domain objects, I mean those business objects which we intend to persist in the database. In our case, it is the user object. In this course, we'll see how to create instances of these two controller classes using different approaches. Everything will become clear once you watch the upcoming chapters. Thank you for watching. Hello everyone, here are the classes. Here we create instances of service classes using new operator and here we create an instance of input DAO impl and instance of output DAO impl using new operator. Now that we want to create an instance of input controller and an instance of output controller, all we have to do is declare a bean tag for each of the classes in the configuration file and specify the class name. If the class implements an interface, that is if the controller classes implement an interface, then also we should specify only the class name and not the interface name. When the container reads this configuration file, it will create an instance of the specified classes. Now let me switch over to STS. Here are our classes. Let me include a print statement so that we will know if this constructor was invoked or not. Same way, let me include a print statement in this constructor too. And here are our declarations. So, bean tag for creating instances of the controller classes. Now, let me build the application. Let me start the server. The lines are printed, which proves that the constructors were invoked. Now, let us see if the application is working or not. It won't. Let us see why. Let us look a little bit at Spring MVC. See, normally when a browser sends a request to the server, the server will forward the request to the dispatcher servlet. The dispatcher servlet will then consult with an implementation of interface handler mapping to determine to which of the controller classes it should forward the request to. In order for this to work, each request should be mapped to a controller class. And we do that by prefixing the value of the ID or name attribute with the forward slash. This is only to map a request. We don't have to do it for other classes. For instance, if we want to create an instance of a service class or any other class except the class in the presentation layer, then we don't have to include the forward slash. So this is what we are supposed to do. Just prefix the value of the ID attribute or name attribute with a forward slash. Let us try again. Let me stop the server. Include a forward slash. Let us build the application. Start the server. Fine, the lines are getting printed. Now let me launch the application. Well, the application is working. Now let me enter the name, age, sex and hit submit. Well, a record got created and the output is displayed here in the output page. Thank you for watching. Hello everyone. In the previous chapter, we saw how to use bean tag to create an instance of input controller and output controller via the constructor. In this chapter, we will see how to use the bean tag to create an instance of input controller and output controller via factory method. All we have to do is write a factory method. See here, get instance and here is another one. So, we have one factory method here in the input controller class and another one here in the output controller class. Next, specify the name of the factory method in the bean tag. So, when you have a factory method in your class and you want Spring Framework to invoke the factory method instead of invoking the constructor, include the factory method attribute to the bean tag and specify the name of the factory method. Now, let me switch over to STS. Here are our classes. Here is our factory method and here is a factory method in output controller class and here are the declarations. Now, let me build the application.
start the server. See here, the lines are printed inside factory method of input controller and inside factory method of output controller. So the factory method is getting invoked to create an instance. Now let me launch the application. Enter the name, age, sex and hit submit. Well, a record got created and the result is displayed in the output page. Thank you for watching. Hello everyone. In the previous two chapters, we used bean tag to create instances of input controller and output controller. That is one via constructor and another one via factory method. In this chapter, let us see how to create an instance of input controller and output controller using annotation. Step 1. Declare the namespace for using a tag called component scan and declare the schema location. Next, declare the tag and specify the package to be scanned. This enables Spring to scan through the specific package that is com JFT controller and Spring will examine the classes one by one in that package and see if they are annotated with at component annotation. If yes, then Spring will create an instance of that class. One more thing, annotations like at controller, at service, at repository, at configuration or meta annotated with at component annotation. So classes annotated with these annotations will also be picked up by Spring. These annotations are called stereotype annotations. They specify the role played by a particular component that is a class. So controller classes are annotated with controller annotation. Service classes are to be annotated with at service annotation and Finally, DAO classes are to be annotated with at repository annotation. Let me switch over to STS. Here are our classes and see here we have the at controller annotation and here are the declarations context colon component scan. So in order to use component scan tag, we should include the context namespace. That's what we have done here. And then we have to specify the schema location. Now let me build the application. Start the server. Launch the application, enter the name, age, sex and hit submit. Well, a record got created and the result is displayed in the output page. Thank you for watching. Hello everyone. Up until now, we were using an XML file to configure the Spring Container. In this chapter, let us see how to use a Java class to configure the Spring Container instead of using an XML file. Here is how we do it. Step 1. Create a Java class and annotate it with at configuration annotation. This class is called configuration class. Step 2. For each bean tag, create a separate method and annotate the method with at bean annotation. Step 3. Within each method, create an instance of the desired class. See here, new input controller and then new output controller. Step 4. Configure the instance if required, that is assign values to the properties of the instance. Step 5. Add a return statement to return the instance. Step 6. Set the return type of the method to the desired class or its super type. Finally, add the necessary mapping, that is slash input slash output and same way here. Next, we need to configure the server container by making some changes in web.xml. Set the appropriate values for the context class, param and context config location. See here now this is the container implementation that will be used annotation config web application context. So earlier we were using XML web application context. Now it is annotation config web application context. And then instead of XML file, now we are using a Java class as the configuration file. One more thing, name of the bean method will be the ID of the bean. For instance, see here name of the method is equal to the ID. If we want to provide a custom value for the ID, then we can specify it along with the bean annotation. Now ID of the bean will be some ID. Let me switch over to STS. Here are our classes and here are the declarations. See here we have a method for input controller and output controller. And one more thing, I have used the names as 1, 2, 3, 4 for the methods. Uh, please don't do that. I have just given it for demo purpose. In production, don't use such names. Use some meaningful name. Now let me build the application. Start the server. Launch the application. Enter the name, age, six and hit submit. Well, a record got created and the result is displayed here in the output page. Thank you for watching. Hello everyone. In this chapter, let us see how to use the util namespace to create a list of objects. Actually, this is only for demo purpose. I just wanted to show you how to use the util namespace to create a list of objects. 
here I am creating a list by declaring the list tag in the configuration file, getting that bean in the input controller and using the values to display the list of languages in the input JSP file. Actually there are other ways to display the list but for now just focus on the syntax and usage of the list tag. All we need to do is declare the namespace that is util namespace and the schema location. Then declare the list tag and include the values using the value tag. Note that value tag is a sub element of the list tag. Now in the input controller I am getting the bean using the id and place that list in the model object and finally return the view and the list is displayed here in the JSP. Let me build the application. Start the server and launch the application. See here we have the list of languages. Now let me enter the name, age, sex and select English and Latin and hit submit. Well a record got created. Please note that this is a new table user underscore lang just added one extra column earlier all this time we were using user underscore table now we just added one extra column for demo purpose and also see here the result got displayed in the output page see here there is an extra column language is known hope you understood thank you for watching hello everyone in this chapter let us see how to use the util namespace to create a set of objects before that i want to show you something in the previous chapter we had a list of languages English, Latin and Hebrew. Let me do one thing. Let me add a duplicate element and let us see what happens when we run the application. First let me build the application. Stop the server. Launch the application. See here the duplicate element is getting displayed here and also the insertion order is maintained. That is, see here English, Latin, Hebrew, they are not in alphabetical order and the same order is maintained here too. That's because it is a list. Now let us see how to use the util namespace to create a set of objects. It is exactly the same as the list tag. Only difference is that since this is a set, it won't allow duplicate. Let us build the application first. Start the server. Let me launch the application now. See here, the duplicate element is not getting displayed. Though we have specified Hebrew twice, we have only one entry. But the thing is, here too, the insertion order is maintained. That is English, Latin and Hebrew. That's because the default implementation is the linked hash set. If we want to display the elements in alphabetical order then we can go for a tree set all you have to do is include an attribute called set class and specify the implementation of interest same way let us change it here that's it now let us build the application start the server launch the application See here, this time the order is changed, that is it is displayed in alphabetical order. Though we have as English, Latin, Hebrew, here it is displayed as English, Hebrew, Latin. So it's working. Now let us try entering the name H6 and then selecting a language. Hit submit. Well, a record got created and the result is displayed here in the output page. Hope you understood. Thank you for watching. Hello everyone. In this chapter, let us see how to use the util namespace to create a map object. It is exactly the same as the previous chapter wherein we used util colon set tag. Now instead of set, you have to use map and then instead of value tag, use the entry tag and provide value for the key and value attributes. That's it. Now let us build the application. Start the server. 
launch the application. See here, we have the entries displayed here. The default implementation is linked hash map, and that's why the insertion order is preserved here. Now, let us do one thing. Let me add the map class attribute and specify Java util dot tree map to display the entries in alphabetical order. Also, I'll change here. I'll change linked hash map to tree map. Build the application. Start the server. Launch the application. See here, this time we have it in alphabetical order. Though we have entered as English, Latin, Hebrew. Here it is English, Hebrew, Latin. Now let me enter the name, age, sex and it's submit. Fine, a record got created and the result is displayed here in the output page. Thank you for watching. Hello everyone. In this chapter, let us see how to use the util namespace to create properties object. Let's say we want to avoid hard coding text messages and retrieve them from a properties file. Well, here is how we do it. Create a properties file. Add the entry. Next, add util properties tag to the configuration file. Specify the ID and then provide a value for the location attribute. And since our properties file is in the class path, prefix the location with class pop colon that's it next in the controller class get the bean from the container see here message is the id of the bean see it is equal to this value so get the bean and place it in the model object and in the jsp replace the hot coded text so dollar that's it let's build the application start the server launch the application See here, the title has changed from demo application to web application. Let me change it again. Build the application. Start the server. Launch the application. See here, title has changed. It says this is a demo. Hope you understood. See, all the util tags we saw, that is list, set, map, properties, do nothing but create beans of their respective type. That is, they create a Java object of their type. That's it. They are for creating objects. Hope you understood. Thank you for watching. Hello everyone. In this chapter, let us look at bean scope. Scope attribute of a bean tag determines how many instances of the class Spring will create and when will Spring create those instances. If scope attribute is set to singleton, then Spring will create only one instance of the class and Spring will create that instance at the start of our application. That is when we start the server after deployment. This is the default scope. If scope attribute is set to prototype, then Spring will create an instance of the class every time it is asked for and Spring will not create the instance at the start of our application. That is, objects will be lazily created, meaning only when they are asked for. If scope attribute is set to request, then Spring will create an instance of the class every time a request is sent to the server and Spring will not create the instance at the start of our application. Similarly, if scope attribute is set to session then spring will create an instance of the class for every session and spring will not create the instance at the start of our application scope equals request and scope equals session are applicable only for web applications let me switch over to sts so here are our controller classes first let us set the scope to singleton let me build the application start the server See here, the constructors are invoked which proves that Spring creates the beans at the start of our application. Now let me launch the application. The input page gets displayed but then constructor of the input controller is not invoked for the second time. Now let me enter the name, age, sex and hit submit. Constructor of output controller is not invoked yet. The values are stored in the database and the results are displayed here in the output page. Let me close the browser and try again. Let me launch the application. See here, we still don't see any new invocation of the constructors. 
This proves that the same singleton instance of input controller and output controller are in use. Now let us set the scope attribute to prototype. We still have the print statement here. Let me build the application. Start the server. See here the constructors are not invoked at the start of our application. Now let me launch the application. See here the constructor gets invoked and the input page is displayed here. Now let me enter the name, age, sex and hit submit. Well, constructor of output controller is invoked. Values are stored in the database and the results are displayed in the output page. Let me try again. See here once again the constructor gets invoked and the input page gets displayed. Now let me enter the name, age, sex and hit submit again. The constructor of output controller is invoked. Values are stored in the database and the results are displayed here in the output page. This proves that different instances of input controller and output controller are created. Let me stop the server. Now let us set the scope to request. Let me clear the database. Let me build the application. Start the server. See here, the constructors are not invoked at the start of our application. Let me launch the application. See here, the constructor gets invoked and the input page is displayed. Now let me enter the name, age, sex and hit submit. Well, constructor of output controller is invoked. Values are stored in the database and the results are displayed here in the output page. Now let me try again. See here once again the constructor gets invoked and the input page is displayed. Now let me enter the name, age, sex and hit submit. Again constructor of output controller is invoked. Values are stored in the database and results are displayed here in the output page. This proves that different instances of input controller and output controller are created for each request. Let me stop the server. This time let us set the scope attribute to session. Let me clear the database. Now let me build the application. Start the server. See here the constructors are not invoked at the start of our application. Let me launch the application. See here the constructor gets invoked and the input page is displayed. Now let me enter the name, age, sex and hit submit. Well, constructor of output controller is invoked. Values are stored in the database. And the results are displayed here in the output page. Let me try again. See the input page gets displayed. But then the constructor of input controller is not invoked. Now let me enter the name, age, sex and hit submit. See here, constructor of output controller is not invoked. Yet the values are stored in the database and the results are displayed here in the output page. So we had two requests in one session and the instance was created only once per session. Now let me close the browser and try again. See here, once again, this time the constructor got invoked and the input page is displayed. Now let me enter the name, age, sex and hit submit. Again, constructor of output controller is invoked. Values are stored in the database and the results are displayed here in the output page. This proves that different instances of input controller and output controller are created for each session and not for each request. Hope you understood. Thank you for watching.
Hello everyone. Before leaving, let me reiterate what we learned. There are two ways to configure a Spring container. One using XML and another one using a Java class. We can create objects using bean tag or we can create objects using stereotype annotations. That is at component, at controller, at service, at repository. And finally, we can create objects using at bean annotation. First approach that is using bean tag is totally based on XML configuration. Third approach that is add bean annotation is totally based on a Java class configuration. With the second approach, we can either use an XML configuration or a Java class configuration. That is to enable the annotations, we can either use context colon component scan tag in the XML file or we can annotate the Java configuration class with at component scan annotation. If what I said is confusing, then try thinking it as a two step process. Step one, which approach are you going to use to create the beans? That is, are you going to use bean tag or at bean annotation or stereotype annotations like at controller, etc. Step two, which file are you going to use to configure the spring container? XML or Java class. If you choose bean tag in the first step, then you should choose XML file in the second step. If you choose add bean Java config annotation in the first step, then you should choose a Java class in the second step. If you choose a stereotype annotation in the first step, then you can choose either an XML file or Java class file in the second step. One more thing, in chapter 9, we used at bean annotation to configure the resource handler like this. Like I told you before, this is Spring MVC component and I have not covered Spring MVC in this course except for the occasional mention of it. But I felt that you should know this. Actually, in real projects, when we use Java config to configure the Spring container, we will configure the Spring MVC components by making the at configuration class implement an interface called web MVC configurer and override the desired methods. Also, we use at enable web mvc to enable spring mvc xml equivalent of enable web mvc is mvc colon annotation driven tag i have not used this in order not to confuse you well you may ask then why mention it now that's because i don't want you to be in doubt or confused or wonder if our approach is wrong when you see such configuration real projects so be aware that the at bean approach is totally right it's not wrong and we can use this approach too. And another thing I want to mention is that there are many attributes for the bean tag, but I have mentioned only these four attributes. I have mentioned about most of the other attributes in my other course on Spring. Thank you for watching.